Hi friends. Hello Ashish. Hi Mamta. And a very warm welcome to all our viewers. I wanted to let our viewers in for the discussion we were having about the history of India. Do you know friends? India has a long and unbroken history of its civilization. A long long time by any standards. Calculations can be mind boggling. Even if we go by the current expectancy of life that hovers around 65 years, can you begin to calculate the number of generations we are talking about? The assimilation of cultures was like a confluence of various tributaries in one big river. To give what we have today, the cultural heritage that is very unique to us. And this confluence has left its mark on all areas of life. And the most prominent among them is perhaps the monuments of India. They are really a treasure trove of information, provided we know how to gather the information. In fact, historical monuments offer so much of general and specific information that understanding can become tedious. And it is for this reason that our first segment, Kaise Jane Wo Daur Kaisa Tha, deals with only the walls and gates of monuments and how they help the jigsaw puzzle of history. So, take a look. The buildings of the yesteryears have turned into monuments of this day and age. These buildings have witnessed incidents, developments of passions and sensibilities, of power and death, of war and peace. They are a living testimony to the planning and architecture of those times. Looking at some of them closely, will help us understand the history with its context. Let us look at a fort, especially the Red Fort. The walls protecting the Red Fort were made of red sandstones. The walls of the Red Fort extend up to about two kilometers in length and vary in height from 18 meters on the riverside to 33 meters on the city side. The height and width of these walls also highlight the efforts which its creators put in to ensure the protection of the city within the fort. The walls have not only survived many besieges and attacks, but also weathered many storms and natural calamities. Yet, their majesty does not go unnoticed. What could have been the reason for using red sandstone in its construction? Perhaps its easy availability. This also tells us about its use since centuries Indian artisans knew about the red sandstone long back and used it discriminately. Mining of red sandstone was an important commercial activity in Western India. Redstone was also used for decorative purposes. The intricate jalis were made of red sandstones and other materials such as marble. Its use and ornamentation work on roof, floor, paving, pillars, beams, arches, doors and window sills etc. tells us that the builders were aware of the need of creating durable aesthetic structures. Decorating buildings using varied building material was also in vogue during those times. In the Red Fort, the inner sandstone walls are beautifully decorated 
with floral designs originally painted in gold. This also provides us with evidence about the advancements in architectural planning and about the knowledge of chemical compositions of different stones and how they could be best used. The same applies to the many gateways that one notices in these monuments. The sheer size of these gates emphasizes the drama, opulence and the power of the ruler who commissioned it. Most of the gateways had single entries so as to ensure the safety of the fort. These gateways were named after the place towards which they open. For example, Lahori Gate opened to the road leading to Lahore. So just by looking at the walls and gates of the particular monument, we can gather much information about the lives and the times of that particular era. A careful study of the structures within these forts, mosques, commemorative structures, and scientific masterpieces will open a new world of information for us. This was really informative. You know, whenever you visit a place of historical importance, you're always in a hurry to get to experience it. And little do we know that if we observe closely, we find that we can begin right at the gate. And the walls too. Don't forget them. And the most important mark, the durability factor. They're really solid structures. Yes. And yet the conquerors managed to conquer them. And despite the fact that there were towers, moats and other defense systems in place in different forts. Yet walls and fortification was very important then. One of the greatest examples is the Great Wall of China. It was a highly durable defense mechanism that saved China from innumerable invasions. Here I would like to mention the fact that durability is not always about size, though it does matter. Yes, it depends on a number of factors and we have innumerable artifacts which have survived through the centuries. Which give us the precious information about the history of India. Artifacts from Gandhar and Mathura School of Art are fine examples of what we are discussing. They tell us a lot about the art and culture of those times. So let's take a look. Art has a language of its own, even though the depiction is usually inspired by life, religion or imagination. One of the early centers of art was situated in Gandhar. Gandhar was the region of what is now known as Northwestern Pakistan and Eastern Afghanistan. This school of art was commonly known as the Gandhar School of Art. A special and distinct aspect of this school of art was the depiction of Buddha in various forms. Buddham, Sharanam, Gachami. Before this, Buddha was depicted through symbols as Buddha himself discouraged idol worship. But due to the Mahayana sect of Buddhism gaining dominance, the Buddha was portrayed in this form. The Mahayana sect presented Buddha as a celestial being. During the reign of the Indian Emperor Ashoka, around 273 to 232 BC, the region became the scene of intensive Buddhist missionary activities.
and in the first century, rulers of the Kushan Empire. Kanishka was the most famous of the line of Kushan rulers. His capital was at Purushpur, presently known as Peshawar, and the other capital was in Mathura. Gandhar and the basins of Indus and Ganga valleys came under the Kushan kingdoms. Due to the cultural influence of the Roman arts, the Gandhar school of arts incorporated many motives and techniques from the classical Roman art. Which included vine scrolls and cherubs bearing garlands. The basic iconography, however, remained Indian. The Roman influence is also seen when Buddha is depicted with a youthful Apollo-like face. Dressed in garments resembling those seen on the Roman imperial statues. Form delineation of muscles and other physical details also depict the Roman influence. The position of Buddha was generally frontal and Prabhamandal was used around the head of the Buddha image as an indication of divinity. Bodhisattvas were also shown as kings representing the temporal attributes distinct from the spiritual domain of Buddha. Instead of a naturalistic style, the artisans opted for an idealized abstract image. The Gandharan craftsmen made a lasting contribution to the Buddhist art. Mathura was also an important center of art. It flourished under the Kushans, 48 AD to 220 AD. Most of the work of art was not only Buddhist, but Jain and Brahminical works were also produced. Buddha of this school had a round face shaven head and skull cap. The robe was close fitting and fell in concentric folds in shallow relief. One of the significant stone images of the 2nd century AD represents the Shakyamuni standing erect. This representation of Buddha in stone exercised a dominant influence on art in other parts of India. The Yaksha and Yakshi images are also noteworthy specimens that occupy an important place in the Buddhist law. On the railing or the edge or the relief panel of the stupa, various incidents have been depicted like Buddha preaching to the gods in heaven. Buddha's descent from heaven and also Jataka tales, the stories about Buddha's previous births. In Jataka tales, we see Buddha in his various incarnations, sometimes as a king or a nobleman or as an elephant or some other animal like monkey, deer and lion. In 
these stories, Buddha in various forms performs virtuous, kind and intelligent acts. Most historians today believe that both the schools of art, Gandhar and Mathura, originated irrespective of one another. Though both seem to have an influence on each other, Some of the sculptures do look delicate, don't they? Well, they have survived the test of time. These artifacts are a great visual treat for the eyes. But there are some areas which deserve mention. They are seldom touched upon because they are theoretical and abstract. Indian mathematics is one such example. Apart from the fact that the concept of zero and the decimal system was presented to the world by Indians, there was a lot of work done in the field of geometry too. There was a practical need also. You know, it was required to correctly assess the taxes. So what are you waiting for? Let's go ahead and watch the advancements of geometry in ancient India. Vigyan, Itihas ke se. The knowledge of ancient Indian geometry becomes available to us through the texts called Sulva Sutras. The word Sulva is derived from the word root, which means to measure. In fact, the geometry in that period was called Sulva Shastra or Raju Shastra, and a rope with knots was used as a measuring instrument. This instrument was named as Sulva. There are innumerable references in the Rig Veda about the construction of altars of different shapes and sizes, which we now commonly study under the geometric shapes. Sulva Sutra, dated about 8th century BC, gives us the steps of construction of fire altars in the form of a falcon. Bricks of various shapes and sizes were laid in five layers to form the altars. The theorem stating that the square on the hypotenuse of right-angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of its sides has been explicitly stated in the Sulva Sutras. This theorem is usually attributed to Pythagoras, who developed it about 300 years after Bodhayan. Sulva Sutra and Vedas also contain many geometrical constructions and properties of various geometrical figures. In the ancient text of Sulva Sutra, the Sirds of the type under root 2 under root 3, etc., have also been introduced. Bodhayan and Apasthamba sutras give us a rational approximation of under root 2 in the shloka Samasya Dvikarani Pramanam Tritiyena Vardhayet Tat Chaturthenatma Chatu Sastrim Shonena Savishesha, which means under root 2 is equal to 1 plus. 1 upon 3 plus 1 upon 3.4 minus 1 upon 3.434. These Sulva Sutras 
also have a mention of the solution of the quadratic equation like ax raised to the power 2 is equal to c and ax raised to the power 2 plus bx is equal to c. In fact, Mamta, I would like to share with you the fact that the Vedang Jyotish written in about 1000 BC equates Ganit with the feathers of a peacock and the jewel stone of a snake. Just as these are placed at the highest point of the body, Ganit is highest amongst all branches of Vedas and Shastras. That is truly amazing. I never really knew how important mathematics and computing are in the day-to-day -day affairs of the state, even in the olden days. So that is all we have time for. We'll see you again shortly. Till then, from all of us here, it is goodbye. goodbye.